Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending where you're joining us from today. So my name is uh, Yana Aranda, and I'm the President of Engineering for Change, and I'll be your moderator today. Today we're very pleased to bring you this month's installment of our 2018 webinar series on the topic of engineering a level playing field and getting humanitarian supplies to market. Uh, we're so excited to have this webinar today as it falls in conjunction with the United Nations Science, Technology and Innovation Forum and uh, it seems to us that's a rather appropriate time. Now, the webinar you're participating in today will be archived on our webinars page and our YouTube channel. So both of those URLs are listed on the slide that you see in front of you today. Information on upcoming webinars is also available on our webinars page. E4C members will receive invitations to the upcoming webinars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinar series team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And if you're following us on Twitter today, I'd like to invite you to join us in the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Now, <clears throat> before we move on to our presenter, oopsies, um, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities worldwide. Some of these challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. For more information, please visit our website, as you see on the slide here, and sign up. Now, today is a particularly exciting day because uh, we have a, an announcement of our own. So there's a real struggle when it comes to finding technical information about products developed for and used by those living under constraint. Data is often scarce, biased, or inaccurate. These information gaps have had a number of consequences. For example, loss of lessons learned and reinvention of the wheel when it comes to technology-based solutions, challenges in assessing performance and scalability, ineffective implementation of solutions, and lack of transparency and accountability for poor quality or unsafe products entering the market. In 2011, E4C took on this challenge of co -designing a, by co-designing a resource with our community of development engineering experts. That resource is our solutions library. We took a phased approach and stress tested our framework for several iterations with a growing early adopter community. Today, we are very happy to announce that the solutions library is now launched as an E4C member benefit. What does this mean? Well, for those of you who are online right now and already familiar with the Solutions Library, this results in integration and improved user experience for you. We will transition the Solutions Library as a fully for C member benefit. There's a new user experience design and related content tie-in, so you'll be able to see related news articles and webinars such as this one. There's also improved functionality in the form that both E4C experts and users are able to upload photos, user experience reports, and case studies associated with the various products. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Solutions Library is also supported by a diverse group of content partners and a multidisciplinary network of hundreds of expert advisors. And we're very excited to share that we also work quite closely with our research fellows uh, who are globally based and in 2018 include 16 incredible young people who will be working with us to source information for the Solutions Library. As I mentioned, we have fantastic partners, one of which is the Level Market. Um, as you will hear, we have a shared commitment to transparency, informed decision making, and better solutions uh, out to get to meet end user needs. We are working actively together to further develop the framework around solutions information, evaluate success, and evolve data tools to ensure these mutual goals. 
E4C will work with Level Market to serve as a diligence, plat diligence platform and distribution resource for solution seekers seeking volume orders and to get a quote directly via the Level Market. And what you will see in the next slide is an example of a product, as you will see from the Level Market. This is the Life Shelter, uh, emergency shelter that is available today on the Level Market. And what you will see when you arrive at our platform is acknowledgement of the Level Market and a place where you can click directly to get that quote. So with that, I'd like to invite all of our participants uh, to share with us. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a few housekeeping items. Uh, let's practice using the WebEx platform by letting us know where you are in the world. Now, in the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type in your location. I will get us started and type in where I'm coming in from today. All right. If the chat window is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon in the top right corner. You can use this window to share remarks during the webinar. And if you have any technical questions, you can send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin as well. So, and I see some folks also using the Q&A window, but I would like for you to use the chat, please. So we have folks here from Indiana, Minnesota, Chicago, Colorado, Venezuela, Alberta, Nepal, Tunisia, Peru, Rome, um, worldwide participation here, India, Oregon, Panama, um, so excited to see all of you here today, and Oregon um, as well here I'm seeing. Um, we're so thrilled to have you join us today. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window exclusively um, for typing in your questions to the presenter, and that is located directly below the chat. Again, if you don't see it, uh, click the Q&A icon in the top right-hand corner of your screen. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try up opening WebEx in a different browser. E4C webinars qualify engineers for one professional development hour. To request your PDH, please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C professional development page after the presentation. That also is available, and the link is also available in your member dashboard where you will actually be able to see what webinars you've already participated in. So you can just uh, go to your member dashboard when you sign in and get that information as well. Um, all right. Thank you again for everybody for entering your locations. I really appreciate that. Now, it's my pleasure to now tell you a little bit more about today's webinar and our presenter. As I noted earlier, there's a real struggle when it comes to finding the right products and deploying goods to those in need. In 2015, the level market began building an e-procurement marketplace for aid and development products to allow nonprofits to request the supplies they needed in the form of crowdfunding campaigns. Whether the supplies are for preparedness programs, a development initiative to help those in poverty, or for disaster response, crowdfunding can quickly get them in a transparent and cost-effective way. Today, we are joined by Stephanie Cox, founder and CEO of The Level Market, to provide insight on how a global marketplace can speed delivery of humanitarian products. And just for a little bit of background, Stephanie has spent almost two decades leading technology and consumer goods companies in conflict zones and emerging markets, spanning food security, water and sanitation, clean tech, and microfinance sectors. With field work in more than 20 countries and as a survivor of the 2004 Asian tsunami, she's witnessed the plight of those living in poverty and suffering from disasters. Her extensive time in Asia and Africa has given her a deep understanding of those needs aspirations, and buying habits of aid organizations, as well as consumers at the base of the pyramid. We are so honored to have Stephanie join us today, and I'm going to turn it over to her to share with you some information about the level market. Wonderful. Wow. Thank you, Yana. That's fantastic. Um, if everyone can see, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Um, so thanks again, Yana, for that introduction. Um, it's great to be here and be able to be part of this great community of like-minded individuals. And I just wanted to give you a good shout out and a congratulations about the Solutions Library. We're really excited to be partnering with you all and um, look forward to a really bright future and getting these aid uh, solutions to market. Um, just uh, 
Today, I want to discuss two main ideas with everybody. Um, how a global marketplace can help get humanitarian products to market. And secondly, and most inter interestingly, um, how crowdfunding could be another sales channel. Now, Yana gave you a brief introduction about me, but I just wanted to give you a little bit more about who I am and why you may or, or may not want to be listening to me today. Um, I am a, a social um, entrepreneur, um, a solar tech startup executive, um, an international aid expert, and a tsunami survivor. I've grown social enterprises from about 200,000 in annual revenue to over 40 million. Um, I was named an everyday tech hero by a UK charity, the Nominate Trust, in 2016. Um, in 2018, became the Entrepreneur of the Year runner-up in Colorado Biz Magazine. And I also run my own podcast called 22 Light Bulbs, which features humanitarian entrepreneurs. So any of you out there who um, are um, manufacturers or suppliers of humanitarian aid products would love to talk to you on our podcast. But right now, I'm going to just take you back uh, to 2004. Um, about 14 years ago, when I was on a small wooden boat in the middle of the Indian Ocean, when the deadliest tsunami in history struck. I was there working in Nepal during the Civil War on an aid project, and I went to Thailand for a much-needed break. I was one of the lucky ones who made it out of the boat and up to the jungle, but more than 230,000 people died. Hundreds of thousands were left behind, and they desperately needed life-saving products like lights and tents and blankets and aid couldn't come soon enough. This experience shaped my life in many ways. In the 10 years since, I crisscrossed the globe working for social enterprises, helping to create business solutions to poverty. Um, the challenge was always taking a, a pretty awful situation and looking for ways to meet the needs of the people and enable the businesses to profit. Um, we spent a lot of time, um, this meant introducing products often like water filters that could help people improve their quality of life. Um, often, though, as some of you probably uh, find in your field work, it's quite hard to find these products locally or globally. We would spend hours and days, if not longer, um, hunting down um, these core innovations um, and coming up uh, with very little. So I became pretty good at looking for opportunities in challenging environments, and today we're facing pretty challenging environments. Today, we're in the midst of the worst humanitarian crisis, and I used to say since World War II, and we have now surpassed that, unfortunately. In the next 24 hours, over 28,000 people will become displaced and in need of humanitarian aid, much like this boy and his family. And in addition, more people will be affected by natural disasters per year than the entire population of the United States. And we know that climate change isn't helping. So as a result, Requests for humanitarian aid are increasing by over 10% every year as hundreds of millions are being affected by these disasters. In 2014, I was talking with a colleague of mine in Sierra Leone who was working with the WHO, um, and he was tired and he was hot and he was pretty distraught. And when I asked him how his aid efforts were going, he told me that they were pretty horrible. He told me they were out of clean drinking water, they were out of buckets, and they were out of body bags. Now, this proved to be the deadliest outbreak of Ebola to date. Um, more than 11,000 people died, including 40 aid workers. Later, an AP investigation cited shoddy supplies, red tape so thick, and death by conference call, as health officials argued about the proper color of body bags. Now, the morning of this call, I had just ordered shoes off of Amazon for my child to be delivered to my house the very next day. So how many of you on this call buy books on Amazon currently? You purchase your airline tickets on Travelocity or review a restaurant on Yelp. So we live in an e-commerce world, don't we? And as humans, we are accustomed to using e-commerce and marketplaces for everything. But when it comes to aid, we step out of that world and we tend to resort to old behavior. And decades ago, Silicon Valley created a marketplace for just about everything we can imagine, except for the goods that meet the basic needs of humanity. Now, here's just five things that my colleagues and I regularly encountered over my 18 years in the industry. Number one, um, there is no easy way for suppliers of humanitarian products and buyers to connect. Uh, as some of you probably know, we often have to travel long distances and show up at industry, industry trade shows, and that costs 
thousands of dollars. Number two, there's little competition, so poor products are being dumped on poor people. Three, paper catalogs gather dust while Google searches and Excel spreadsheets and faxes. Yeah, faxes still remain the norm. I just had somebody the other day ask me to fax them something. Four, prices aren't published, so there's absolutely no price transparency. Um, I encountered this over and over in my career where we wanted um, baseline pricing for certain technologies and it was virtually impossible to find uh, pricing that was listed. Um, shipping is problematic at best. So we all know that international shipping and at least getting a lot of these products to where they need to go is incredibly expensive. Um, there's very long supply chains, and that's not even talking about the last mile distribution. Um, there are very few uh, warehouses and depots around the world that house these products, so the supply chains are incredibly long and, and expensive. So the result of all of this is that people fall further into suffering, deeper into poverty, and they die waiting for aid. Empires, oligarchs, and malaise. It's not Russian history. It's actually the characterization of the humanitarian system by a London uh, King's College report in 2016. The report called the system, quote, ill-equipped to deal with emerging humanitarian events. And then Tufts University said that this enterprise, this humanitarian industry, is the world's safety net and it provides essential services to the survivors of conflict and crisis, but there are huge gaps in inefficiencies. So that day that I was on the phone with my colleague with the WHO, I, I had a bit of a revelation, the constellation of events in my life from working in Nepal during the Civil War to the tsunami to Ebola, all revealed to me that just as other industries have been transformed by the ease and speed of today's e-commerce processes, they have yet transformed the world's most critical industry, our industry. So why not take the best technology of Silicon Valley and apply it to humanitarian aid? So around 2006, a revolution began to design products for those challenging environments. Thousands of new technologies have been invented to help better access food, shelter, energy, water, and often they have higher efficiencies and better price points. So you can just take a look at Kickstarter and all of the products that get launched on Kickstarter. Or take a look at the 12 and growing humanitarian engineering departments at major universities around the world. However, few of those technologies actually find their way into the hands of those that need them the most. The humanitarian and, and development space has never been more relevant, and yet there is a real struggle when it comes to finding the right products and deploying goods to those in need. Just as Amazon meets all of our wants and desires, I believe that the aid industry needs a marketplace for the basic goods that 90% of the world actually needs to thrive and survive. Now, almost 10 years to the date after surviving the deadly tsunami, we began working on creating what we conceived as an Amazon for aid, and we call it the level market. We aim to prove an open and transactional marketplace that can enable nonprofits and governments and, yeah, the private sector that is a major player in this space around the world to access life-changing, essential, and innovative supplies quickly and at a fair price. So in a day when, when I can order shoes from Amazon and a click of a button, I believe we should be able to provide shelter for children in Syria. I imagine a day where aid workers know where supplies are and how much they cost and can order them on their mobile phone in just a few clicks of a button. I imagine a day where warehouses around the world are stocked with mosquito nets and clean birth kits and cook stoves and, yes, buckets and body bags. And I imagine a day when e-commerce will serve humanity. So about two years ago, we began creating this marketplace for relief supplies and innovation. We aim to make it as easy to buy water filters for children in Ethiopia as it is to buy books on Amazon. You see, we fill a void that was missed by the tech world and the nonprofit world. We provide a marketing platform for global aid suppliers to connect to global aid buyers. We are a B2B e-commerce platform. We streamlined financial transactions. We built a quote system for international and volume orders for a highly audit-oriented industry. 
So you see, we, we pulled tools and information forward to help buyers make a quick buying decision, like pricing and specs and manufacturing locations, minimum order quantities, certifications, inventory levels. We have global supply companies eager to save uh, the cost of sales by listing on one central platform. We currently have over 55 global suppliers and 270 products across eight categories and growing by the day. Um, but the greatest thing is that this can be a way for local suppliers to list their products, and this is a big topic uh, in the aid industry, is how are we going to engage local manufacturers and local suppliers, and many of whom I have met in my travels and in my work around the world. Um, they are eager and capable of uh, selling and distributing uh, their supplies, but they have no platform in which to list uh, what goods they have, how much they cost, uh, where they're available, and how soon people could get them. So instead of scrambling to find out what's available locally, um, suppliers and manufacturers can actually list their products in inventory on our 24-7 uh, marketplace. So a good example is um, during the Nepal earthquake, when we weren't even in business yet, we were uh, inundated by people sending us Excel spreadsheets trying to figure out what supplier had what locally and how close to Nepal um, supplies could get, Pakistan, Bangladesh, how, India, however close they could get, but it was all spreadsheet based and it was just in my mind such a waste of time when they could have simply uploaded what they had and where they were located. So there is a huge universe of potential buyers for these humanitarian goods. Um, there's over 75,000 government entities that procure goods. There's over 10 million NGOs in the whole world, and at least 40,000 of them are focused exclusively on aid. And what's more, um, and it's a really hard number to calculate, and we've pulled together this because no one's attempted to do what we've done before, but this industry spends in procurement over $100 billion every year. And very few people think about that when an earthquake happens or um, a hurricane hits, how all these supplies get procured and how much is really happening on an annual basis. And, and, and that's how much is um, being procured and sent around the world. So the good news is that there are, though, two industries working to help people and, and solve some of these problems. And so one is this humanitarian industry of the procurement side, which is $100 billion, But the other one is also this charitable giving side, which is $390 billion. So what's still the problem? Well, something happened along the way while we were building uh, our marketplace. Donors and nonprofits and investors were asking us that they could use our marketplace to procure supplies on behalf of the nonprofits working in the field. And then Hurricane Maria hit and devastated Puerto Rico. So we were outraged ourselves. We were infuriated. And even though we're running this global marketplace, we felt helpless until we had an aha moment. And that moment was when we realized that, yeah, we could use our marketplace to help get more supplies to market through crowdfunding. We can also create some transparency along the way and give crowdfunding a bit of a facelift. So just stay with me for a moment and, and imagine, have you ever written a check to a nonprofit and then wondered how your money was used? When was it used? Where did it really go? You see, the problem with crowdfunding and online giving is that donors actually don't know where their money is being spent nor the impact of their giving. So while people respond generously to crises and, and you know, uh, GoFundMe raised $3.5 million from Hurricane Harvey alone, their current crowdfunding platforms are only cash-based and they don't have tracking once the donation is made. So money flows into a general pot and donors know, no, don't know the true impact of their giving. So we built level giving into our existing global marketplace. So instead of cash, now donors come to our marketplace and they buy physical relief products like mosquito nets, cook stoves, shelters, clean birth kits from pre-vetted suppliers. We knew we could use the basic principles of e-commerce, such as customer support and shipment tracking, so that donors could track their donation from the moment it's made until it's used by the nonprofit in the field. And so we feel that that would give confidence to the donors in how their money was actually being used. And this is all based on the need that the nonprofit has in the field. See, so with level giving, we aim to get more supplies to market by giving donors 
an opportunity to buy them on behalf of a nonprofit. And the nonprofit receives the goods and distributes them. So right now, we actually have just beta tested this and launched this. We have two live campaigns right now. Um, we invite you to go to our website and you can also participate in them. Now, online giving is a $31 billion market in the United States alone. Um, and it is also growing over 7% every year. So this is a huge opportunity to excite people around humanitarian innovation. And as I mentioned before, we know that shipping is one of the big, biggest obstacles in international aid, and, and you probably know that too. It is expensive and it takes a long time. So we secured major partnerships with logistics companies, including one called Flexport, a California-based company that is worth over a billion dollars, um, and iContainers uh, based out of Madrid. And they've already guaranteed that they will be shipping for the humanitarian industry the supplies at cost, um, and they'll be using speedier supply lines because they use artificial intelligence and other technology to maximize supply routes. We also have over top 50 top-tier humanitarian suppliers of solar lights and shelters, clean water filters, you name it, loaded up in our marketplace, ready to serve the needs of the nonprofits. So we invite you uh, to join us. If you have a product or an innovation you'd like to list on our marketplace, if you know a nonprofit that wants to buy your supplies um, but is unable to do that, we can raise the money for them through level giving. If you know donors who'd like to buy aid supplies instead of just giving cash, um, we can certainly help them do that too. And if you know of a manufacturer or supplier who would like to be featured on our podcast to tell their story to get the word out, um, please contact me. Here is the contact information, and I will thank you right now for your attention and am excited to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. This is a really just a fantastic, and I, I invite our listeners now to um, include their questions in the, in the Q&A window. Um, uh, this is uh, so thrilling for us, especially um, as there's a lot of overlap in terms of the products that you see in the level market with what we have in the solutions library. And, and we feel quite strongly about the fact that it's really important that uh, does that informed decision making. So one on that note of informed decision making, one. Uh, point that has come in and question is uh, kind of sharing uh, the, the pain of uh, procurement. Um, this, uh, this listener notes that your point about unpublished prices is something that I've suffered with. Do you know why companies like Delagua, et cetera, don't publish their prices? Yeah, I, so often, you know, the prices aren't published because we deal with volume orders. And, and that's, that, that's legitimate, right? Because yeah, you can publish, right? Can you hear me? Yep. So, you know, you can publish um, an MRSRP price or a basic price, but typically in international development and international aid, um, you're not dealing with onesie, twosie orders. In other words, you're not dealing with single unit orders. You're dealing with volume orders. And depending on the volume, the pricing will go up or down. And that's often why um, we don't get transparent pricing. However, um, we expected a lot of our suppliers to push back against um, having just one uh, published, you know, a no published pricing. So in order to list on our, our marketplace, they must publish baseline pricing. That, mm -hmm. gives, that gives the customer, right, a sense of is it $10, is it $100? Like give, give me an idea of what this costs. Mm -hmm. And of course, if we order more, we know that the pricing will most likely go down. And so um, happily, there's been no pushback um, on um, pricing transparently. And so that's been a really happy revelation. Fantastic. So uh, another question here is, um, level giving has an option to choose a specific location for the purchased good, or is it, oh, sorry, my question just moved as I, of course, naturally wanted to read it, um, or is it dependent on the organization? So I think the question is, can you choose a specific location for the supplies that you are uh, contributing to, or is it only constrained by the organization that is oh. supplying that good? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there's a few. So on the marketplace, there's a few ways to find the supplies that you need. You can do it by where where the supplies are manufactured. So if you 
for example, take the Nepal example. Um, so if you are interested in getting goods into Nepal, now you can search by, you know, where the uh, manufacturing location for those supplies are or uh, where they ship from, which is, which is mm -hmm. very important because sometimes it could be different locations. Um, also, we, we have the headquarters addresses of the manufacturers as well. Um, so, so we have many, many filters in the marketplace that allow users to sort and find and filter exactly what they're looking for and get as close to uh, what they're looking for as possible. Fantastic. And another question uh, has come in relative to regulation, um, and this, uh, this listener wants to know, do you get pushback from governments within regions, and if so, how are you resolving those uh, challenges? Yeah, so, you know, um, in on, you know we've, been, we've been live for about a, a year and a half. We've had orders from over 38 countries. Um, we've had a few orders from government entities, and so far it has not been an issue. Um, in fact, um, one uh, order just went through for um, uh, female condoms going to uh, someplace in Asia. Um, it tends to be, um, you know, we don't participate in um, tenders. So we do get inquiries about tenders, um, but when governments purchase, uh, they're really purchasing directly through uh, the supplier. So you can think of us as, you know, the marketing platform and the transactional platform and the lead generation platform for suppliers where all this information is, is housed. But at the end of the day, um, the negotiations really are between that customer, the government entity and, and that supplier. That's why we allow the certifications, the specs, you know, we work with World, Blank, World Bank Lighting Global, we work with Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, work with industry bodies to also make sure that, you know, we're getting high quality supplies. But thus far, there's been no pushback yet uh, from any government entity. Fantastic. That's great news. And uh, another question is related to the procurement itself. There is interest in understanding whether the level market is limited to humanitarian organizations, or can, for example, the private sector uh, procure purchase these products uh, for themselves, let's say uh, the private sector within Ken uh, countries like Kenya or um, in Nepal themselves, if they wanted to purchase uh, directly from the level market, would that be an option? Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, you know, this is something that I'm pretty passionate about. You know, the, the private sector actually has a huge role in humanitarian aid. Um, when I was working at the solar tech startup um, and there was a, um, a, what was it, a hurricane, I think, in, in the Philippines, it was the private sector that was buying all the solar lights um, mm -hmm. within their community. So they were buying the solar, solar lights from us, shipping them, and then distributing them. Um, and so the private sector is, is, a, is a big player, uh, particularly in international aid and relief, because it's also their, their community. Um, it's also mm -hmm. part of CSR of a lot of corporations. And so we do not limit uh, who can purchase. Uh, we do ask questions of the, of, of the customers, you know, um, you know are, mm -hmm. is this for humanitarian purposes? Is this for distribution purposes or, or, or resale? You know, what, you know, we try to vet them. But um, we're certainly, you know, this is part of us wanting to be an open and transparent marketplace. Um, but ultimately, it's up to the suppliers to decide whether or not they're going to make the sale. Um, I've been surprised that there have been quite a few suppliers who have turned down sales because the customers don't meet their um, profile of a perfect customer. That's their prerogative. Hmm. That's, that's great. Um, as a business person, I wouldn't necessarily turn down a sale, but, but they, <laughs> that's their prerogative, and I think it's fantastic. Right. They know who they want to sell to and who they don't. Some will only exclusively sell to nonprofits. Um, some will sell hmm. to any of them. That's why we've created an open marketplace mm -hmm. and let them decide. That's fantastic. There's a, on the note of uh, nonprofits, um, another listener has noted that your presentation seems to talk mostly about suppliers and donors. I work with a small local NGO and have some links with the local government who also have trouble sourcing supplies. What would you say to people in my situation, and namely people looking to buy? Yeah, that's a, you know, it's a great question. Um, you know, our, our beta test of the marketplace uh, was really interesting. You know, we thought that we would attract, you know, um, larger aid organizations in the government, but, you know, they're pretty set in their ways, and that's just because they've been doing stuff since 1919 in certain ways. Um, mm -hmm. And so the people who actually opted in first 
um, were the small to medium nonprofits. And so nonprofits in Venezuela and Guatemala and um, who had no what I call butts and seats. They didn't have procurement officers and they didn't have a lot of red tape. And they needed these supplies just as much as everybody else, but they wanted good quality supplies, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, your local civic organization like Rotary or Lions Club or whatever that is in, in your state or country, um, you know, they often pack their suitcases with stuff and hop on a plane and go somewhere. We want mm -hmm. them to take good quality stuff. We want them to take the good stuff, not just do a Google search and not just buy what their neighbor had, but, but really think about what's needed and um, what's going to last long and what's not only based on price, but also, you know, eventually based on reviews and everything else. So for small nonprofits that are looking to buy, the best thing that I can say is launch a campaign through Level Giving. That's why we added this into our marketplace. So in other words, the marketplace is, hey, XYZ nonprofit, um, come buy the goods or, or government or whomever, the goods that you need, right? Because they all have budget line items for, for goods that they regularly know that they need. The level giving aspect of it is, um, hey, nonprofit, we know that your budget is constrained. Why don't you have other donors, now the consumer side, come in and buy those goods on your behalf? So, for example, we have these two live campaigns right now. Um, we're sending 250 clean birth kits to Malawi. Um, donors have come on and purchased those goods directly for uh, Birthing Project USA, which is going to be receiving those goods in Malawi. So Birthing Project USA knew what they wanted. They knew how many they wanted. They knew where they wanted to go. Um, and donors have bought them on their behalf. And that's, that's about to wrap up as our first successful campaign. And so you can see that people really want to do this. They will, the donors will be actually able to track that shipment of those birth kits all the way to Malawi, and that excites mm -hmm. them. Um, so I would say that is a great way for other small to medium nonprofits to get involved and get the goods that they need. That's fantastic. Um, on, on the note, um, there's a question here around actually delivering uh, the supplies. How is it ensured uh, that mm -hmm. the ti that timely supplies of basic required goods um, is achieved for those who need them uh, in disaster struck locations. So um, maybe you can speak a little bit more about the logistics uh, aspect of how do you track uh, those shipments and how do you guarantee timely delivery to what extent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, um, I think this is the bane of everybody's existence in humanitarian aid is, is logistics and, and shipping. And this is why it was really important for us to go out and um, invite the private sector in to also do business with us and participate in this market. Um, that's why we were able to secure um, significant partnerships with uh, Flexport and with iContainers. We wanted to do it differently. Um, these, are, these, these logistics partners um, have shortened supply chains by at least six days. Now, you might not think that's much when you're just ordering, you know, a book on Amazon or something, but when you're dealing with saving lives and stemming suffering, that's in a huge amount of time, and that's a lot of lives saved. Um, they just haven't been able to break into the humanitarian market, and so by aligning with us, um, we certainly um, aim to uh, bring the shipping times down. Now, they use artificial intelligence. They use uh, technology for these supply chains. So they will guarantee at least door-to-door -door shipping. Um, there has to be, has to be, um, you know, a good quality nonprofit there to receive the goods and distribute the goods, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's really important for the last mile distribution. You really don't want somebody else to do it for you. Um, the way the model is now, and it's always evolving, is that um, the local nonprofits, so in this case, Birthing Project USA or World Hope International, who we're also working with to get goods to Puerto Rico right now, they are going to be the receiver. They will clear customs. Um, and they will um, distribute uh, to uh, the end users. So if um, customs needs to be cleared, um, I, you know, we can uh, work with brokers who will do that. Um, there is a, a, you know, a cost to that, but often um, the nonprofits know how to negotiate that and work with local brokers to clear customs too. Um, it, you know, it is very complex, but I do think, I believe in everything can be simple, simplified, and I think by bringing in multiple partners, um, we're able to, to crack this nut and do it a little differently this time. 
Oh, that's that's really great and actually dovetails really well into a follow-up question from our listener who's noted, I've tried talking directly to suppliers about importing their products. They prefer to, prefer to go through an intermediary to help with import charges. How do you manage this area of import taxes and procedures? You kind of already touched on it. Maybe you can expand a little bit. Yeah, so we don't, you know, we, the level market and level giving um, are involved in that aspect of it. However, um, we have found that we've become um, a repository of advice um, on both sides of the marketplace. We have an um, active blog, too, where we answer a lot of these questions, and we take customer questions and turn those into Q&As. Um, so I do uh, advise you all to also check out the blog for mo more information um, and, and subscribe to it. Um, but like I said, if you are the importer on record and suppliers will only get it to, the let's say, the port, um, my recommendation and, and I is is to get a custom clearing agent that you like that's local, um, a local broker. Um, I think that that is the best way to secure that your your shipment is actually going to clear customs um, and it's yeah. also going to clear customs in a timely way. And that is only something that you can do locally is to know um, who is who is doing this and who's on the up and up. Uh, and able to clear your clear your goods and get recommendations from people locally. I would not leave it in the hands of an international shipping company, frankly. Mm -hmm. That's some sound advice. And uh, I have a, a really interesting comment here. Um, someone wants to confirm it. I, am I right to say that the level market is playing uh, the the business model is like. Alibaba of emergency <laughs> products. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm laughing because. Um, I guess about a year ago, I met with um, a founder of Alibaba. I think it was like, you know, employee number eight or something. And uh, yeah. he looked at me, right? And he said, oh, my gosh, you're Alibaba for humanity. Well, that's a huge undertaking. <laughs> um, yeah. but, but the answer is yes. And also, um, I will answer the follow-on question to that, that that probably hasn't yet been asked, but it begs this question. So why isn't Alibaba or Amazon doing this, right? Um, you know, I, my goal is to start this conversation, to bring transparency to the space, and to say to people that there needs to be an Amazon for aid. There needs to be an Alibaba for humanity. If you know, we have a humanitarian imperative, right? These products need to move around the world the way that stuff that nobody really needs moves mm -hmm. around the world. These things need to be efficient, <laughs> not just in UN depots around the world, but for all of us small to little people working in in in, in aid organizations mm -hmm. and small nonprofits, so that we can access them at a fair price and quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And so I look at I look at the level market as the catalyst, as the conversation maker, as 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 the one that's going to push the edge. And I will be happy. I will be so happy if one day Alibaba or Amazon wakes up and says, "Oh my gosh, this is a market to take seriously. This is a market um, to use our supply chains, our warehousing, our knowledge, our technology on for the better of humanity." Um, and so I look at it that we are proving the market. And if someone can come on and do it much better than us, then I will welcome that. That will be a happy day. Oh, I'm, I couldn't agree with you more, Stephanie, and this is one of the reasons why we are working together uh, is to really push that, that needle forward because it's so essential and to democratize this process. Um, so on the note of kind of the impact, and you're speaking about, you know, the tremendous impact that is available, uh, there's a question here requesting more information on what an impact report includes. This is something you spoke about in your presentation. Mm -hmm. That's a great question um, because what, what the initial impact on, this is on uh, level giving. Um, and mm -hmm. we've been beta testing these these two campaigns, and they're going really well. Um, and we actually, when we work with the nonprofit to set up their campaign, we we tell them you must send an impact report within six weeks of the campaign closing, because mm -hmm. donors want to know how their money was used. The first initial impact report is just what was shipped, what was distributed, how many lives were affected. Right? Just give mm -hmm. us the numbers and give us that first thing. Um, Throughout, though, uh, their their work on the ground using these supplies, 
we want to work with them to keep communicating back to the donors about more things about the impact. So we all know nonprofits do a lot of m and &E and a lot of EIAs and a lot of impact reporting. Um, they do it for a lot of their, you know, institutional donors. And we're just saying, hey, share, share that with these donors that bought, you know, a few kits or a few lights or a few water filters because their money counts too. Um, and so the initial impact report is how many goods, where did it go, who did it help? And then follow-on reports will be much more detailed, um, and that's what we're working on right now as we transition from the beta phase um, to the scaling up phase and level giving. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that insight. Uh, so um, one of our um, participants uh, sent a chat trying to help out another uh, colleague who asked a question about customs, but as she said, sent it privately. So I'm going to go ahead and read it really quickly as it seems sure. like a good nugget. Mm -hmm. um, so for those of you, uh, that listener who was interested in uh, learning a little bit of managing uh, customs, uh, this uh, um, listener suggested uh, that you should match your harmonized code, HS code, with a customs book, your country issues, for better knowing customs related uh, issues. Uh, these are all standardized around the world. Um, so okay. hopefully that helps. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, we, we, I think we've uh, hit all our questions that we received from our audience, and I'm sure folks will be happy to get an extra 15 minutes back to go about their work days or perhaps uh, author a nice email to you, Stephanie, asking for further questions and, and uh, getting on the level market. So uh, with that, I, I would like to thank you, Stephanie, for, for your time, for, for your concise presentation and, and your detailed answers to our listener questions. And I would like to thank all of our uh, listeners today for attending. We really appreciate you uh, joining us today. For those of you who are interested in receiving your professional development hours, the PDH code is listed on the slide. And uh, you can go to your member dashboard um, in order to get the link directly to apply for those PDHs. If you have questions that we haven't addressed or that you haven't thought to ask until now, please email us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. We'd be happy to pass on uh, the questions to Stephanie. Um, as a reminder, the presentation is recorded and will be posted on our platform so you can come back and listen to it again and um, get inspired. And uh, we'd like to invite all of you to uh, become e 1st members, to get information on upcoming webinars, and to access our solutions library, as well as products from the level market through the solutions library. You'll get all the information you need to make good decisions. And with that, I wish you all a good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you are. And I hope to see you on the next e 1st webinar. Take care.